it will look when it's printed. I actually have to explicitly paginate it. The hardware simply wasn't able to keep up with uh, interactive pagination. Sorry. But let's step back and think about what I've said here. Okay. So, I've created a multimedia document, properly uh, typeset and laid out in a WYSIWYG fashion. Uh, if I were to print that, this is exactly the way it'll show up. And I did it with fewer than a dozen commands, as I claimed I would do. If I wanted to print this thing, I mean to um, say, well, print it, or to mail it, what I would do is drag it to one of these uh, icons. So, in fact, here is where I guess I forgot to point out when I was talking about icons. We divided the icons into two classes, data icons and function icons. The function icons operated on the data icons. The data icons were documents, folders, record files, spreadsheets. The function icons were mailboxes, printers, file cabinets, and so forth. The way you got a function to operate was by using the move key. You selected a data icon, said move, and then clicked on a function icon. So I've just invoked the mail command by using the more generic, in general, move command. So all I have to do here is type a um, address, say done, and it will go off and mail this thing for me. So I want to sum up here. There's a couple of lessons that I think bear thinking about. <sighs> 17 years after Star came out, 1,000 times later in machine speed, memory density, and disk density, Star's interface still is simpler and um, more consistent and more usable than the systems we see today. In fact, the most pleasant experience for me in this whole thing, um, actually Dave Kerbo has had to do all the hard work of, of making this hardware one. All I've had to do is get familiar with Star again. And the most pleasant part of all that is um, finding out all over again how well Star um, uh, has, has survived, how, the, how well the ideas have held up in the intervening 17 years. It doesn't seem like an antiquated system. In fact, if there were any way I could use this thing, <laughs> I would. But there's nowhere I can print it. Uh, nothing I can print it. Nowhere, nobody who can read this email. This email, by the way, that I just sent, uh, you know, it had, it had equations in it, and it had all sorts of non-ASCII stuff in it. But it doesn't matter. It just all went. Yeah. <laughs> The way, um, so Star had many fewer commands than today's system, and it didn't do it by having fewer functions. It just had fewer commands. And the way we got, we accomplished that, I hope I illustrated, was through the use of generic function keys, through objects that had property sheets, through virtual keyboards, and through smart objects that would do a lot of the hard work for you. We also had a taxonomy of icons, data and function icons, that led to simple ways of doing things. Namely, you move to a function icon, and that uh, handled a whole bunch of commands there. And lastly, this notion of a copy paradigm meant that I could do quite fancy graphics if somebody had created a little graphics transfer sheet for me to use. All I had to do is then copy those things into my document. OK, that was pretty much the demo. Um, now Dave Kerbo is going to talk about some of the um, technologies other than the, this interface. Obviously, the interface has been picked up by, by all personal computer manufacturers and 
most workstation manufacturers. But there are a lot of other technologies in STAR that have also been picked up by other companies, and Dave's going to cover some of those. So the version of STAR you saw is the version that they were working on when I arrived in 83. And if Robert was blown away when he came here at the hardware design, um, I was really blown away because I came from a, heart, from a um, mainframe operating system background just before this. And um, I'm very proud to have been able to work on this project for so many years. Um, my job in this whole thing has kind of been, I had, I had some hardware in my garage that I got from Alan Fryer and some more people. And in the course of my work, I managed to figure out how to make it work again. And so we were able to do a demo for the Kai conference, Human Interface. In fact, I became a Human Interface designer at the end of my um, Xerox stay because I was so impressed with the user interface and I wanted to do a better job for everybody else. So I went to Apple and, and worked there as a Human Interface designer. Um, well, long story. Um, but um, so we went to the Kai conference and everybody was really impressed and John Schock suggested that we do this again, and so since everybody's covered all the interesting things, I thought I'd tell you about the, well, not the interesting, but some of the things that people don't really notice. Can I have a slide, please? Thank you. Great. I hope. So um, all of those, all those wonderful things Dave showed with equations and all that, that was, that was, it worked because we had, you know, not just ASCII. Um, and also, we, we supported, oh, gee, let's see. Um, in the very first release, we had Russian, French, Swedish, um, lots of other things. And then like six months later, we supported Japanese. So in the end of, of 82, I, I believe, is, is when JSTAR came out. And it may be tough to see, but this is actually um, Japanese typed on the screen and printed. And in the course of, of the next few years, um, Xerox Character Code Standard, which, which became um, Unicode, really, Unicode came from this, supported every major language, um, some, some little known facts. Some of the other you know, innovations you may not be aware of, directory services, we call them clearing houses. Um, they derive from um, originally Grapevine here at Park on, on the uh, on the altos. Um, now, 18 years later, they're all the rage um, with, with LDAP and Microsoft Direct, Active Directory. Of course, Novell did support um, directories for a number of years, and they were, I'm told, extremely similar to Clearinghouse. Um, courier, remote procedure calls, you know, originated here. Uh, of course, it originated with, um, with the altos first, and we productized them and shipped them. Um, Print protocols, um, the internet printing protocols that you guys, if you're really into printing, you may care about, um, derive from here. Um, CUSP, CUSP was customer programming. It, basically, it was in user programming. It, it was intended to allow users to program. Well, it actually turned out that more like consultants program, but anyway, um, it was an English language programming tool that was, that was extremely popular with some of our major customers. Um, I'm told that Lufthansa Airlines did everything from, from menu planning and everything else using CUSP. Um, that's kind of metamorphosed into metaphor capsules, um, slightly different, and AppleScript, a project I worked on at Apple for a while. The intent was, in, again, to allow users, uh, well, really consultants, um, to be able to automate um, stuff on the system. Um, boot servers. Well, boot servers, um, if, you, if you use an Alto, you knew you, you downloaded things like Maze War um, and, and other games um, and, and applications. Um, in, in our product days, we shipped something called boot servers so you could boot installer and utilities and things like that from the network. Um, that's metamorphosed into application servers that now download things like Java applets, um, WebLogic and Kiva slash Netscape. Um, do this now, very popular. Um, only 
so many years later, remote access, the ability to, from someplace remote, like your home or someplace out, out in the field, dial in through a modem and be connected transparently to the network at the other end, um, cause Alan Fryer no end of grief trying to make it all work. Um, but it really looked like you were on a very slow Ethernet connection. Um, and of course, that's extremely popular now in, in the nomadic world that we live, where everybody carries a notebook computer and they want to plug in, but they have to dial in to, to work to get stuff. So that's just a few of the things that we did. Um, I want to say thank you for all the people who helped make this happen, like Kathy Ching and Stella Timmons and um, well, of XSoft, who, who provided me with some floppies that they managed to find, um, as well as some hardware. Um, Alan Fryer, who helped make all this hardware work in the first place. And of course, Tony Stafford, who has a garage, I'm told, full of metaphor machines. Um, these, in fact, are 10 megabit, or sorry, 10 megabyte, very first um, 8010s. So they're very old. We're, we're very happy that they're still working. We, uh, he also managed to find in his garage a box of software that he, when he left Metaphor, Metaphor, got rid of the stars, whatever it was, this stuff went to his house for some reason, and it has, <laughs> he had a box of software. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Dave. Um, so anyway, there's, um, in this box we found um, software from 1983, 1984, which we actually, we actually last night loaded floppies from 1984, eight-inch floppies that still loaded and still worked. Um, we did have a bit of a problem with product factoring, trying to find, trying to find keys to, to unlock it, but a scrap of paper was found with a password that worked, and so we were able to last night product factor things and make it all work. So we're very, very thankful to Tony for, for stashing this stuff. Um, and of course, to the hundreds of people here um, who worked on STAR, um, of which I was just one of those people. Thank you for coming. And now we'll do Q. Oh, I'm sorry. There is two more things I should tell you. Um, let's see. If you didn't sign the poster out outside, the, the, the people who worked on the star, please do so. There is a poster somewhere. Um, and the Xerox Star retrospective, which Jeff Johnson and people worked on, Jeff has kind of provided a few copies if you're interested in that. And now we'll do Q and A. So. about history programs that question and answers go on too long. <laughs> and I'd like to point out, first of all, it's valuable information for historical record. We take these programs for that. So I'm not inclined to stop the question and answer at any point. And anyone who wants to leave at any time is perfectly free to. You don't have to now or during the question and answers. Peter. <laughs> Uh, those who do not learn from history are compelled to repeat it. <laughs> and I'd like to suggest that, that even though many of the good ideas in Star have been published and published well, that there are also important aspects of it that don't really uh, transmit their value to subsequent generations except in the form of code. So I'd like to ask the following two questions. Number one, uh, can anyone make a substantial case why Xerox should not put the entire source code of STAR into the public domain? And number two, were Xerox to do such a thing, would it be, able, would it be possible to find it? <laughs> we, should, we should repeat the question. Where's Mark Weiser at this point? The, uh, Peter's question is, is there any substantial argument as to why the STAR source code ought not now to be put in the public domain. And secondly, if there were an agreement that that were an acceptable thing to do, could anyone lay hands on the original star source code or a facsimile thereof in order to do that? Um, I can't possibly answer either of those questions except to say I, can't, I cannot myself automatically see um, a reason why it couldn't be as some other classical source code is um, uh, in the public domain. But that would be an issue for Xerox to to uh, sort out the the other question, though, about the availability of it, um, who knows? I, I, I imagine it must I think be around. Has an answer. 
Um, well, in fact, up until two, three months ago, um, Xerox was still supporting the products. Um, there, had, there had been a new virtual machine implementation built that ran on top of Windows. It runs very fast, actually. Um, and um, they tell me that they have gigabytes of stuff, but they're not quite sure what versions and stuff because it's just a small crew that was finishing the maintenance. Um, they stopped supporting it just recently. I suggest you talk to someone at Xerox. Mark Weiser is nearby. There is a virtual machine implementation. It is a Xerox product that was sold until about two months ago. It runs on? It runs on PCs, Windows. We have a question over, way over here. Is the start program, uh, is the start program, uh, the year 2000 compliant? <laughs> <laughs> is it year 2005? They, they have no way. Oh, there's a, but there's a wonderful answer to this, actually. Uh, it, although it's not year 2000 compliant, it does have some fairly nice features about uh, uh, dealing with dates and other things like that. When is it? It hasn't blown up yet, though. Is it year 2000 when it hits the wall, or is there something earlier? I think the timestamp actually blows up around 2020 or something like that. Yeah. I think that there is a problem with the configuration software, which uh, if Alan can rewrite it, it doesn't let you uh, configure a new star. I tried entering 00, zero and it said no way. Uh, that but that's code, just, actually. that's your code? Okay. Yeah. But that was, <laughs> well, but that's just the code to, uh, to set the time on the machine. It had a few idiosyncrasies where it really couldn't keep time forever. Um, we, so it, we tried. So it is year 2000 compliant. It's not year 2020 compliant. <laughs> Ron Crane. Uh, no, a side note, the, the XNS time protocol is a 32-bit number, which is the number of seconds since January 1, 1901. And that 32-bit counter rolls over around 2020. Yes. I have a question uh, regarding chip which Who's the person who designed it? Uh, is Xerox is still using it. Uh, it. It's a wonderful program that uh, uh, I see designers would, would love to have them in their hands. Do you know anything about it? What was the name of the program? Chip which Chip which For the little programming? For, yeah. We use the Canal Segunda for IC design. We were the wrong ones. Yeah. Oh, no. sorry. Yeah. We just use SIL and, <laughs> and, and you, didn't, you weren't allowed to design ICs. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Oh, Charles. Yeah. I'm uh, Charles Ernie. Uh, one of the things I thought would be useful for Dave to comment on is, is the design methodology that we use. And the fact that we design this based on abstract notions of what the functionality were rather than the specifics of the interface. So they may need to say some more about that. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. I'm the first day, good second. Why don't you take the question? Yeah. yeah. Charles asked about some comments about the work that was done um, on the design methodology. Dave Smith referred earlier to the fact that it was done in a principled way. Uh, in fact, um, I commissioned a, uh, you might say, a task force, uh, which uh, Charles Irby uh, chaired, as it were, to develop a methodology first. So before we did the design, we decided on a methodology for user interface design um, so that we'd be able properly to manage both the process and the abstractions that we were going to be working on. And then as the user interface design was done, um, in stages and to attack different tasks, there was a very sort of con consistent approach. The information display was designed independently from the function invocation, for example, which turned out to matter a great deal. And both of those were designed independently from the user's conceptual model. And this was the first time that anything like this had been done, either the development of a methodology per se or then a principled user interface design. Um, that's one of the reasons why STAR, from a usability point of view, 
is such a great improvement over most of its successors is because we actually did it by designing it using a set of principles rather than just sort of randomly copying what someone else had done or kind of debugging it into existence. So that turned out to be very important. Um, um, Charles himself and, and uh, Dave Smith, Eric Harslam, and Ralph Kimball, along with Linda Bergstenson um, and a number of people from Park who were still in Park proper but were happily helped us by joining our task force. And uh, I include uh, Larry Tesler, um, Charles Simony, um, at least Bill Verplank, a number of other people as well. So it was a big and very um, focused effort. Um, some people thought, gee, it's a long period of time just to decide what you're going to decide or to design how you're going to do the design. But I feel that it uh, really served the process and the subsequent in industry very well. Yes? It seems pretty clear that one of the major shortcomings of STAR was the thing that you cited about a turnkey closed model as opposed to somehow seeing in the crystal ball that the independent software market was going to come into existence. Uh, there was some speculation at part at the time that such a software market would come into existence, but of course it was all just speculation. I, I'd be curious about what you think and, and what Dave Smith and the two thinks also about whether that was uh, something that at, at the time was just impossible to have foreseen in the start of the program, it would have just been overreaching itself, or whether looking back on it you feel like, gee, you know, I wish we'd gone the other way and tried to make it over the well, I'll say what I thought, and, and, and I think I'll it too. The question was, um, uh, in retrospect, um, doesn't it seem as if you could have thought that you should provide more of a programmable open system, even though there wasn't an independent software industry at the time? And uh, we actually did make the XDE, the Xerox Development Environment, in such a way that it could be packaged up and shipped. And we did begin shipping it to customers about, if I remember, about 18 months after we launched the product. It was, however, designed for fairly serious pro hardcore programming use. And we did not understand a lot about what it meant to export and support that kind of an environment. But I, um, it, it actually always was a part of the plan to do that. We just did not put it in front of the other objectives. Later on, of course, some of the objectives for the program changed, but um, I generally feel that if it, ha it had happened earlier, we might have been more a part of jump-starting a better, earlier, um, soft, independent software uh, industry. The first few years of the PC software industry were pretty rocky, and uh, largely because of the tools and so on that were available. So I, I th see it as an opportunity partially missed. Actually, there was a... Um, my first here in 83, there was a project called Phoenix, what was, which was taking essentially the Topo uh, toolkit. Dave, Dave mentioned that, I think he mentioned today, maybe mentioned last time, that one of the problems was we didn't have a toolkit in Star that, 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 that drawn out on the screen required everybody to draw on, on, on the screen. Well, in Tahoe, there was a toolkit for doing that. And in the Phoenix project, um, a toolkit was built. And originally, and, and it became Viewpoint. Viewpoint was an open toolkit-based architecture that intended for um, third parties to develop software for. Um, you had to develop in Mesa and required a little more learning than what most people had. And But it, about 84, 85, we started shipping Viewpoint um, to allow people to do just what you suggested. I, of the volume, some of your questions. Oh, can we have the volume up a little higher? I, I would like to make uh, one more comment about the previous question, Charles Irby's question about the design methodology. Um, Dave Lizelle is correct that we, before we did the design, we did the design for the design. And it's interesting that uh, the principles that we came up with are no big surprises to people today. Anyone in the human factors business, anyone who goes to a SIGCHI conference or reads the journals, it's all pretty standard stuff. It's, it was doing user testing. It's analyzing the tasks that users are doing in their context, trying to figure out what objects they're using and what actions they're performing on the objects. And in fact, um, we, we went out 
many times in the early days to various sites um, and decomposed in excruciating detail the tasks that people were performing, went back and did a design that would, uh, would enable you to accomplish those very same functions, but hopefully in a much simpler and more improved way. I think it's very revealing from an historical standpoint that the SIGCHI organization formed after STAR came out. It, uh, the first SIGCHI conference was in 1982. Yes. I have some information uh, that might be interesting to the speakers. Uh, I work at PARC, and just uh, last week I had a visit from a colleague at Fuji Xerox. He's in the Japan branch of Xerox. He told me that uh, the head to a global view of JSTAR that product in Japan is still active and had been, uh, and that Sony Corporation this year had selected it for, for a system D that they have. And then, for good measure, we uh, opened up a global view system here and the, net, and the network icons. And I dropped a document on this guy's printer at Fuji Xerox in Japan, and it worked. So, uh, speaking of, of J Star and Fuji Xerox and, and so on, I I very well remember when Bill English and and I and Joe Becker and others were there for the launch of the Fuji Xerox J Star. Bill and Joe, of course, had been there in Japan several years getting that program working. And I was not very used to uh, the way that literal translations from Japanese turn into English um, phraseology. And uh, so uh, after, the, the, after the launch, that is on the day of the launch, the booth was absolutely packed with uh, people of all kinds, particularly competitors, people from other companies and so on, looking at the product. And I remember one of the Fuji Xerox uh, marketing folks translating for me the review that was written the next day in the paper. And um, he said, it, it was clear in real time he was thinking how to phrase this back to me, and he said, the Fuji, the Fuji Xerox star is as different from conventional computer interaction as clouds from mud. <laughs> And I thought, boy, you can't do any better than that, you know. Wait, wait, hang on just a second here. I think that Mark was talking about the international features of STAR and how they were a big uh, element in, in the sales that we did have. We should recognize the years of hard and very creative and dedicated work of the man who did, who was largely responsible for the internationalization of STAR. And that, is Joe Becker. Hey. Without whom a lot of these um, tough issues, especially like um, making a selection in Arabic, which starts like <laughs> this, and then if there's an English word, it, it'll go the other way, and then when you go back to Arabic, the selection will go the other way. <laughs> And he made it I all work. That. Oh, and then he said, and what if the writer is writing in Arabic and they're quoting something in Hebrew? <laughs> right? I know. Which was really good. He figured it out. Right. Yes. I'm trying to find out what I've been very curious about what what kind of tools are used to create these uh, programs with, other than the uh, what we call traditional teletype tools, you know, the old you know word processing and assembly and compilers and whatever. Is there any uh, new environments that are coming up which are more real-time interactive for uh, low-level machine language, this uh, native machine language code? I, the, only, the only things I've seen require you to stop the programs before you make changes. I wonder is there any uh, where I could get any information about full bandwidth, you know, object-level uh, programming environment and debugging environments which are not even defined. It's a really hardware face of the circuit emulator. I wonder how you actually work with this new program, how anybody works programs today with the old stone knives and bear skins and whatever tools that they use. So I can uh, look at SD98, and that systems conference, and uh, all kinds of new skills and print on the thing. Yeah. 
on Hopper was extremely fast at the time. It had things in it such as. I remember the, the debugger, you, you could, at, at some point, if you realized, realized you'd screwed up, you could back up and say, no, no, do it like this. Back up down, down the call stack, force a call differently, you know, passing different variables, and go in and, and say, no, no, skip over this and do that. And this was in 80, 87, something like that. You know, it was just amazing tools available that, according to my friends who are still you know, writing code, tell me they're just now starting to see this stuff in some of the new Microsoft products. Um, I'm probably the most nerdy person in this group, and I can't answer the questions anymore because I've done, done human interface. But if you find, like, oh, this man right here. <laughs> um, Charles Haynes, who was the debugger person who put in, well, and, and, and other things. Um, talk to him afterwards, okay? <laughs> And did the machine actually end up on the desks of uh, high-level Fortune 500 executives? The question is, uh, for how long were sales significant, and did the machines wind up on the desk of Fortune 500 professionals? I can, I can answer the second part. I was only here through most of 1982, and then went off and tried to put it similar but different machines on the desk of Fortune 500 professionals, not to print documents, but do other funny data-like things. Um, it is certainly the case that the primary customers were the biggest customers you can imagine. That is, it did indeed go prim virtually always to professionals. As a matter of fact, it was hard to get the sales force to quit trying to sell it to word processing people. Word processing people were proud of their ability to withstand pain, you know, and to know all these complicated commands, and they were not the, the target. And it definitely went in modest numbers, I admit to that very target um, audience. Uh, who can say what was the period over which Star was sold on the various different platforms, including the Sun? I don't know if any of us have the right answer for that. Yes, way at the back. Uh, I fell in love with your design, and I wanted to say thank you. But I also wondered, who invented the undo command? <laughs> the question is, the question following a complimentary statement about a design. <laughs> who invented the undo command? Now, as far as I know, Warren Teitelman invented the undo command in Interlisp, uh, or its BBN Lisp, its prior name. I believe that's true. And it was culturally very strong here in Park, and so it was not optional not to have it in in the system. I think it's fair to say that the idea, that the ability to make text editing documents undoable uh, flows from J. Struther Moore's uh, piece table invention, which was the thing that made it possible to have a text document in which you could still undo it by not irrevocably committing the data structure. Um, that at least would be my assessment. What else? Well, yeah. um, as far as undo goes, I, we might as well uh, come clean here. <laughs> Dave's trying to get a picture of the keyboard. Uh, if we could switch to the camera for a second. All right. <laughs> well, there is a key labeled on the keyboard, undo. Oh, he's got it now, Dave. <laughs> oh, he's not. He's got the camera now. No. Dave, Dave, Dave. <laughs> At any rate, it's one of the function keys on there. And uh, we thought that as designers, that was enough to ensure that it would actually be implemented. <laughs> Unfortunately, in our naivety, we were wrong. And it was never implemented. Oh, and Star did not actually have undo. <laughs> However, we, we did have one, uh, one thing that we did uh, win when it comes to undo. We used to have a contest. Can you find the sentence in the star functional spec that causes the most implementation work? That was the sentence. Every command can be undone by pushing the undo key. Right. <laughs> yeah. When they, you talked about names for the product, that one of the original ones was, was to be Daybreak for the star. How, how, did, the, how did the term star, how did the name star? No, the, the name star was made up by Bob Spinrad, who was at that time vice president of system development. He was the head of SDD at that time. And 
he and I were once again trying to sell it to yet another skeptical senior executive. And we had just been put into the clutches of um, Dave Culbertson, who um, happened to be a sailing enthusiast. And so Spinrad said, let's name it after a, um, a one, uh, you know, a, a sailboat class, okay, a one design sailing class. Uh, maybe that will cause him to be interested in it. And <laughs> star, well, you know, it wasn't very easy to get Dave interested in things. You know? And um, the star was um, both a decent, interesting uh, one design sailboat and also a tolerable name for um, an office appliance. I mean, we looked at a number of other ones, but, you know, somehow lightning didn't quite do it and, you know, <laughs> sunfish and yeah, everything else, but star seemed okay. That's where it came from. Yeah. yeah. Daybreak was the name of the 1685 launch. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, what was your question? Is there any idea how many were actually ever produced? Something like 30,000? Yes. Uh, about the object oriented GUI, which I'm a strong supporter of, but recently you may have noticed there's something of a backlash against object oriented GUIs, or maybe it's more of a muddling, would be a better word for it. Uh, with the longest perspective, perhaps, of most folks on object oriented GUIs, has your faith in object oriented GUIs uh, been shaken at all? Not badly enough to call them gooeys, but we know it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Not a curiosity, if you were to look at the descent lines from the, the star, there's a lot of them. What would be first and maybe some of the second layer ones that you would consider to be obviously descended from, ex descended from the star, at least in idea, mimetic concepts, if you will. I'm thinking particularly that the Lisa might have been the closest. Well, there are a few that were licensees, okay, that is. There was a product done at Sun called... I forget, but it was sun, the Port of the Sun. The Port of the Sun. There was a toolkit done at Sun, under license from Open Look. Open, oh, open, look. open, open look. look. Thank yeah. you. Right, which was a direct descendant. I Similarly, would. the product that we did at Metaphor, we actually had a license for as well, and it was a, a clear direct descendant. Lisa had some similarities and some differences. It was more similar than the Macintosh was. Obviously, there was. Uh, you should pardon the expression, next step, and, um, and uh, motif. Um, uh, what was the, yeah, the, the perk had some similarities and some differences as well. What else? Other guys can think about it. Well, actually, um, this article by Jeff Johnson that uh, they referred to, which are up here, has a very nice chart in it that has quite a dependency a graph of uh, star and everything. So you're invited to come up here and take a look at that. Uh, a lot of hay has been made over uh, a certain uh, visit by Steve Jobs and he showed up here and looked at everything. Whether that exists or not, uh, maybe there's a story there, maybe not. But I'm uh, more curious, uh, you would read a lot, especially maybe in the last 10 years, about how Xerox invented it and everybody else got rich off of it. And I'm just curious from what was the... You know, what can you say about the attitudes or the feelings inside Xerox, uh, inside Park, you know, watching these other machines, you know, garbage, not so much garbage, whatever, making a lot of money. Was it the proud child of our ideas? Was it the goddamn of our ideas? <laughs> we just thought it was great. Okay, we, we just simply wanted our ideas to go out there in the world, and we weren't at all concerned with commercial success. <laughs> Ken. <laughs> Hi, it's Ken here. I'm, uh, I started off before the start at Activision. Dave hired me and I've been at Park for about 20 years. I just want to say this in public. Two of the inventions at Park, okay, make Xerox over $2 billion a year in gross revenues. Just two of them. 
All right? So we're very proud of the money that we have made for this corporation. And they are the DocuCheck and the DocuFrint printers. The other... Dave, I thought you were going to tell one of my favorite stories, and I just have to substitute a couple of words. Uh, remind me, the star, I think, was unveiled at the 1981 NCC for the rest of the world, and the booth was packed, and the Japanese press was there, and they went back and wrote all about it, and when it was translated to me in just the same way, uh, the translator looked at it and said, this says that the Xerox star disemboweled the competition. <laughs> Yeah, I decided to leave that part out, but that's that's true. Research. Okay, Dave, I heard a rumor a long time ago that when the Department of Defense was designing ADA, they came to Xerox and asked if they could use Mesa instead, and we said no. Is that true? Oh. Um, the last question was that he had heard that long ago when uh, the DOD had that high-order language thing on the street, what eventually became ADA, and that they came to Xerox and asked if they could, quote, have Mesa, and that Xerox said no. Um, I don't think that's quite correct. I do remember someone asking permission for us to give a briefing to the ADA committee about a number of the features that were in Mesa, because we hadn't at that time yet really written widely about at least some of the features that were in, that were in Mesa. And we did give, we did sign off on that briefing happening. I think what you may have heard is that th we were asked if we would like to take essentially an ARPA contract to, uh, as it were, um, uh, harden M Mesa to, to be that ADA. And we said no, because we didn't want to do contracting. We were actually trying to construct these um, commercial products, but that's my recollection about it. Peter, do you remember anything about that? Um, that what, what, what was, uh, just said does ring a faint bell that that um, that there was there was interest in Mesa as part of the ADA effort. Uh, I don't remember um, whether, and, and I'm pretty sure that there was there was some Xerox political reason why Mesa was not submitted as one of the candidates in the in the ADA competition. Uh, the person who probably would know the most about that is Butler Lamson. Yeah, maybe Satterquade. I remember okay, coming Sarah. to me and asking how much Dick, can Dick we Dick Sweet, do you know anything about that? Um, no, no more than what you said. Okay. <laughs> what about... Go ahead, Jan. Um, what about uh, Niklas Zurich? When he was at Park, he patterned a lot of Modular 2 after he was The question is, didn't, uh, did, did uh, Niklas Wirtz, um uh, visit to Park and his exposure to Mesa have impact to how he designed Modula 2. I think he, he certainly has said that. I think he's um, quoted that as one of the sources of, of his um, ideas. Yeah. yeah um, the Xerox parts, I mean, the interface from Star clearly made text based interfaces obsolete, command lines obsolete, and it hasn't really been better in 17 years. Someday it's obviously going to be obsolete too. And I was wondering if you had any ideas or thoughts or any research that you've done in Xerox about stuff that's way beyond that type of interface as far as the user interaction. Um, uh, the question was that uh, given that the that the, the Xerox Star and the interface approach that it sort of exemplifies or embodies still seems to be a leading. Um, uh, form and the strong successor to the old text-based interfaces. Uh, he was really asking about opinions about uh, things which will uh, compare to the Xerox Star as clouds to mud. That is, <laughs> what, what, what is it that will what, what is it that will obsolete obsolete the graphic user interface? I think the answer is pretty clear. It's still Windows 98. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about it. Oh, yes. No doubt about it. Uh, well, except of course, even today, you're off the part of this great work in the show. It's just Apple Labs. I want to say one thing seriousness, though. Um,
as I was one of the designers of the STAR interface, I am a little disappointed that in the last decade we haven't really pushed much beyond this desktop metaphor with its documents and folders. I mean, uh, even at Apple, I was unable to get them to willingly go beyond this metaphor. They were just too successful for too long and developed too much inertia. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see it pushed in directions of information retrieval. Uh, one of the neatest things about the internet are all the, uh, the search engines that are out there. Those are just great. And there's no reason you can't do that on your local machine as well. And there's a lot of areas that we could make progress in. And there hasn't been uh, sufficient, anyway, innovation in the last decade. I'd say that's pretty clear. Yeah, I'll, I'll second this as a hardware designer. You know, having the uh, having our MIP rate go from uh, half to uh, 500 and, and seeing the user interface barely uh, change has been an incredible disappointment. I remember uh, on the Star software, if you wanted to run the spelling checker, that was a big deal. You know, you waited a while. In fact, we had spelling checker servers. You know, now and <laughs> so this is the biggest chain that's happened in 10 years is now PowerPoint does spelling checking while you're, you know, entering the characters. And I, I predicted that would happen someday, I remember. So that's the only change I've seen now in 17 years is spelling correction is as you type. Also, paginate. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. Go ahead. Actually, Word still has pagination. It's called fast save. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spent some time at, at, at SPI. I spent some time at Silicon Graphics working with the uh, Nintendo game machine and technology and so forth. And even though I'm not a video game person, if you look at the number of children that are growing up with amazing skill at playing these very, very fast video games, and you think about some of the navigational technology there and some of the methodology for moving around in a space and doing things in that space, especially if it's interacting with you in kind of an entertaining way, it seems to me that there's the germ of a new UI paradigm in there somewhere. I don't know quite what it is yet. And it's certainly not a video game per se, but, but I think it can build on some of the same technology. Well, certainly today we can... Uh... We can build our microprocessors with things like the 3D acceleration for free, essentially. So if I, I am, I really, I know that there was the Insight Group here, which I visited a little while ago, and I would, I would really like to see, you know, something utilize the transistors better on the chip for the user interface. And if it's 3D, we can do it for free, essentially. So we're at that point on technology that that's possible. I think I think Charles actually um, identified if anybody's interested in pursuing it. I'm not in that business myself, but. Uh, a direction to go in trying to push the interface forward, look at the games, look at video games. So, so I want to see a prototype because we're doing silicon that, that we need. Uh, I, I'm just shocked there's no university research or no you know, research at all in this area and I, I really would like to see a prototype and I'll give you the hardware if you give me the software prototype. Yeah, I so. Well, what about all of the VR stuff that's going on? It's a good start. So, go ahead. Can, can you talk a little bit about the invention of uh, the Mesa programming language and why you decided to use Mesa as the language for Pilot and Copilot and Star? Sure. Uh, the question is, how was Mesa invented and why did we decide to use it? Um, uh, the other language uh, alternatives that we had at that time fell into two classes. They were, they were either very much uh, very superior for quickly building prototypes or even building large elaborate systems, but had the, the well-known performance difficulties that you would expect with these two very powerful systems we had here, namely Interlisp and Smalltalk. Okay. It was not practical, obviously, to do an implementation in those, although Smith stubbornly um, continued to prototype um, in, uh, in them for as long as he possibly could. Um, the other set of alternatives that was available at that time weren't sufficiently type safe or had, didn't have the right set of abstractions and so on for building industrial strength software of which you hope to sell hundreds of thousands of copies. So and that was primarily BCPL. C even um, didn't exist at that time. That splendid language embodying the grade given to its designer. Um, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't even here in that, in that moment, so it was BCPL or other very um, weakly protected machine-oriented languages. So Mesa was actually 
quite a nice design. It had a few excesses in it that took us a little while to get out, but it gave us tremendous reliability uh, in constructing this elaborate piece of software. And by God, you made a change to things, and it started running again the way it was supposed to, and so on. So this was a curious window in the history of programming languages. And uh, the idea of building a big software system that was nevertheless going to be replicated and sold very cheaply, so you couldn't ship a systems engineer with every copy, was really quite new. And, and uh, that was uh, the reason for the Mesa choice. Peter. Um, I'd like to just add a little footnote to that. There was, there was a, a, a working group at Park that, that met a number of times. It was a very high-powered group uh, looking at the requirements for a programming language for the work to be done at Park itself. And while that group was not directly coupled to the to the uh, evolution of, of uh, Mesa and Mesa's follow, follows on, in fact, in fact, Mesa had already been developed um, to a to a fair point by that time. Uh, there were there were um, ideas coming directly from Park as to what a modern system programming language needed. Uh, that that I think influenced. Uh, Mesa, the choice of Mesa, very heavily. For example, the fact that, that Mesa has a very rich type safe specific type system and is generally very type safe. Uh, this was not a a popular uh, point of view for uh, you know hardcore system programming in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Uh, and uh, and I think that that uh, it's fair to say that the that the that the, that the Mesa artifact, the ideas in it. Uh, originated pretty much at Park, and and that and that it was it was the apt the apt tool to hand when when the uh, star was being programmed. Yes, over here. Um, I want to respond to the thing that uh, Charles mentioned about uh, 3D interfaces being a direction to explore. It's uh, uh, amusing to me that the rage in video games right now are. 3D multiplayer network games. I recall many years ago, Maze War being a very early 3D. <laughs> 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 The thing that I appreciated about Maze War was that otherwise I never would have gotten people to be willing to test all that complicated internetworking code. And no, no, I'm perfectly serious. It was a wretched testing problem, but people playing Maze, Maze War absolutely tortured every, every line of that code. And I was tremendously grateful for that idea. Dick. In response to the question uh, about uh, why Mesa, uh, Dave Kerber was kind enough to uh, take a, a paper that I had written back in '85 and, and scanned in with the uh, uh, Acrobat Capture uh, and put on his website, uh, which doesn't really go all the way back in history to the stuff uh, Peter was talking about, but it, it has some. It has a bibliography that does, and it, it's a fairly clear description of. Uh, Tahoe, the state of Tahoe, circa 1985. So uh, uh, I don't know if we can make the URL for that available. But, uh, yeah. We'll publish that. I can give another URL. If, go ahead. If you just go, to, well, I will have to put it on tonight, but if you go to Sweet Shop, <laughs> you go to www.sweetshop.com, spelled S W E E T S H O P P E. Uh, that happens to, to be my web, uh, a website that my wife uh, gave me when she changed her domain name. Uh, <laughs> I'll, put a, I'll put a copy of the paper there. Huge. <laughs> <laughs> Not a question, just uh, part trivia. I, I believe it is true that the Maze War, all the programmers were playing it all the time, and of course they, we were all hackers and we were hacking the sources. And as a result of that, the authors got upset with everyone making cheats, and therefore they stored the sources in encrypted form on the source tree. And I believe out of all the software innovation that was happening in the park, the Maze War sources were the only software stored in encrypted form. <laughs> Um, the question is, did Starship with any hidden Easter eggs that I know of? Uh, let me assure you, not any that I knew of. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't bet that there weren't. What else? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>